Uh, mobility. Uh, I have two exciting panelists to hear from today, Sanjana Hattatila on my immediate right and Nalika Gunavardhana beyond. Sanjana, as many of you would know, uh, was the uh, curator and creator of the award-winning site Ground Views, but he uh, wears multiple hats and has multiple identities, which is uh, very relevant for today's session. Similarly, Nalika is trained as a science writer and has worked uh, within Sri Lanka and beyond uh, and continuing to juggle some incredibly interesting roles in the space of technology. Changes in technology, of course, influence human life. Uh, innovations in technology and its use impact on us in so many ways, in our civic life, how we participate in our democracy, in the way we express our identity, in the spaces that we have to use at home, publicly, elsewhere. And of course, many of us have multiple identities. Uh, we have a legal identity, we have online and digital identities, we have professional identities, we have contextual and personal identities such as a parent or a brother or a sister and so on. And uh, technologies that affect our identities can have impact, important effects and impacts on how we as individuals operate at home, in public spaces, how our democracy operates. When we look at our online and digital identities, we tend to operate this at work or at home, but through it, we span the globe. We are no longer limited to or only influenced by our immediate physical environment. And this raises some interesting questions for us as whether we are just the voters, consumers, taxpayers of the immediate society in which we live, or are we contributing and being influenced by a greater global context. This use of social space, typically Facebook, social media, and all the other smart media devices that define who we are increasingly, also raises increasing questions about who owns these spaces, who regulates these spaces, who tells us what is right and wrong in the way we use these spaces. We can also do some forecasting what happens to all of us as we become a generation of life bloggers, as we become a generation that never will be alone, that will never be lost, and that will never forget? What happens to us as a city, as we take ideas from elsewhere? Is it a useful exercise for us to think of the way we use technology and express ourselves just in terms of a city? Why not Sri Lanka as a whole? Why not a city that incorporates so much more than Colombo? Uh, we also need to have an idea of how the use and availability of technology is not available to everyone. Does this create a vulnerable underclass, those who are excluded by reasons of socioeconomic access, and those who are excluded for reasons of, say, improvements in biotech and automation? So these are some of the areas that my expert panelists will explore. By way of format, uh, both Sanjana and Nalaka will make some introductory sp uh, speeches, and then uh, we've agreed to free form it. If you have any questions, please put your hand up at any time. Uh, otherwise, we will continue for about 40, 45 minutes and open the session for a wider chat. Thank you. Sanjana, over to you. <laughs> Thanks very much, Priyanka. I think you uh, laid the foundation quite well there, uh, given that uh, it wasn't entirely clear how we were going to tackle this, uh, this, this topic, uh, even as, uh, as uh, recently as a few minutes ago. Uh, what I'll do is I'll, I'll, I'll share with you some initial thoughts uh, uh, around the topic, and uh, maybe then go with some discussion afterwards. Uh, and I'll do it in, 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 in three segments. The first is actually uh, survey data that you are going to be the first to hear about. Uh, I work with the Center for Policy Alternatives. We have a, a, social, uh, a social polling arm called uh, Social Indicator. And we did, to the best of our knowledge, an, uh, uh, an unprecedented uh, survey, a poll, 
uh, in the Western province and as well as Colombo, looking at media consumption and perceptions and behaviors. This was done uh, uh, in over late, uh, late June, early July. So the data is, is quite recent, and I'm in the, in the process of writing a large report. And I think some of the findings, I was going through a very large Excel spreadsheet, are pertinent to the, the discussion today. And I'm just going to um, um, uh, say some of these uh, as snapshots of our digital lives, as it were, uh, in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in this city, uh, or certainly in this province. 57.1% um, agreed that their web usage would increase if there was more content in Singhala and Tamil. And there was a comparable number who said that if their devices were to support Tamil and Singhala, that they would also increase their web consumption of uh, news and entertainment. 77.3% said that their primary device of, uh, or means of accessing the web and the internet was their smartphone, 77.3%. 73.3% said they were on Facebook. And a high percentage is across men and women uh, uh, in this region. Compared to a year ago, 60.2% said they spend more time online uh, as opposed to a year ago. Uh, in, in respect to the question whether we, uh, we ask them uh, what the service provider can do to increase their uh, internet usage, 35.5% uh, said that it would benefit them if the monthly rental cost, what you pay basically for broadband, was reduced. 37.5% uh, said that it would be beneficial if the data package was increased. So I suppose those two go hand in hand. And 40.2% said they wanted better speed, maybe to look at YouTube videos or whatnot. 42.2%, uh, mind you, this is before the general election, said that they wanted government ministers to engage with the public through social media. And there were other questions around this that I haven't actually uh, captured and I don't have time to in this snapshot go into. But overall, there is an uh, overwhelming majority of people, a younger demographic, who want public representatives to speak with them, not to them, over social media. 50% uh, said that in the past year, they had researched something that they had heard somewhere using online memes. So they might have heard it as a rumor, and they went to kind of suss it out over online media. And interestingly, and that speaks to the kind of society we have, those who get content online tend to share it verbally through friends, family, and colleagues. So the sharing doesn't always occur through the networks that they get the information from. So 61.5% said that the action they took as a consequence of getting something off the web was to actually tell, tell somebody else, as in verbally uh, or, 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 or through an email. And I think this, these are some really interesting snapshots. And, and I think Nala course has had some snapshots. I want to spend the rest of the few minutes that I have talking about some of the dangers and also talking about some of the potential uh, Priyanka, if you allow me as well. So I've, I've, I've done a bit of work on this, thinking through what it means for a city like us, certainly under the Rajapaksa administration, but also as a consequence of the enduring legacy of uh, a suspect rule of law and the kind of uh, uh, evisceration uh, of, uh, of uh, public life and, and governance that we had over the past 10 years and the enduring results of that, what it means to have a digital society, what it means to have people so connected. And I'm concerned that, for example, uh, our ISPs, uh, such that we are all subscribed to, aren't exactly transparent in the way that they gather information of our online behaviors and then share it uh, contra-constitutionally or extra-constitutionally with, for example, the Minister of Defense. We have seen this repeatedly. And there is actually no, there is no check in the law to kind of stop this from happening or to make it more accountable to the subscriber base and consumers. I'm concerned that so many, as has been demonstrated, are on Facebook, but Facebook is algorithmically driven by corporate interests not even based in Sri Lanka. And the new black, the new uh, accepted norm seems to be to trust what you find on Facebook, even though it is algorithmically driven to be in consonance with what you believe in. 
And Ellie Parisa, who's written on this and has a wonderful TED talk, calls these filter bubbles. We think we are connected more, but we actually consume less. We think we are engaging more widely and more deeply, but we are actually engaging more lightly, more shallowly, and actually with those we only agree with. So difference is not a given uh, uh, in, in, in this digital world that we are living in. I think that the new luxury is not BMW or a Audi or a Prado or a Land Rover, but it's access to services. This is going to be the new luxury in our digital age. And those who can afford access to digital services in the future, in five or 15 years, will be able to probably access smart cities and smart clothes. We'll be able to go into like Odell and get maybe a whole range of, uh, of, of clothes available for us on the devices that we have in the palm of our hands based on our, on our previous purchasing habits, our credit card patterns, our body uh, contours, and a variety of other factors that we have voluntarily given but are also collected on our behalf. I wonder, though, whether the marginal today, whether those at the periphery of society today can access those same services in the same uh, way that uh, a few of us may be able to do. So I see that this gradation of access to opportunity could lead to uh, a new discrimination digitally. And that's something that we may want to uh, talk about. Um, in a country where the rule of law is suspect, and I think, I hope that on the 8th of January and last Monday, we have turned uh, a new chapter in our countries. But as I said, there is an enduring legacy of uh, what the former government did to all of us. And I wonder whether the kind of political context that we have in our country lends itself to smart cities, insofar as how do we resolve conflict? Uh, uh, if uh, a smart city is, largely speaking, a uh, 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 coming out of more democratic, liberal, Western contexts, how do we take that ideas, those technologies, those underlying platforms, those ways of working and interconnections, technologically but also socially, and kind of import them in a manner that protects the rights uh, uh, of, of our citizens, given the kind of context that we live in. Uh, and I find that a lot of these debates are very technocratic. We are driven by technology and not by what people want to see as a consequence of using technology. We seem to give less uh, importance to rights and ethics, and we talk more about technology, which I think is a, is a, is a, is a failing. And finally, the potential. I think that what we, what uh, Priyanka has introduced and what Nalaka will talk about, what I am also engaged in conceptually, but also through the work of Ground Views, has the potential to shift to leapfrog the way we have engaged with one another as citizens, not just in Colombo, but in our country as well. I think we will talk about Project Loon and, and in, 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 in subsequent discussions, but we will find ourselves to be living in a country in the next five to 10 years where people are going to be connected. It's not uh, if, it's a question of when. And I think that's going to have profound changes in the manner that governance is conducted in our country, including, for example, with relation to early warning, we may be able to foresee an alut gamma before it actually results in the loss of life or, uh, or worse. Yeah? So these are things that I think we can apply our minds to. And I think that, I'll end with this, that what's interesting for me, particularly because I deal with civic media, is that in the next years, all of us here are privileged. Most of you are looking down at your screens and probably live tweeting or looking at Facebook. And this seems to be the new norm. Uh, when I lecture, there are also students who are tapping away on their laptops. That doesn't mean that they are not attentive to what the lecturer is talking about. But you seem to be able to find people who are able to kind of multitask, uh, engage with the world around them, and also immediately critique. The degree to which I think is, uh, is questionable, but you're going to have co-creation, co-witnessing, citizens as producers, citizens as active agents in governance, and you're no longer be, uh, going to have a country or a city or a political or social or cultural context where privilege is going to have the same currency in the way that it's happened in the past. You're not going to have, for example, politicians who are going to be able to get away with what they have. Uh, whether they like it or not, the political architecture is going to be prized open so that we are going to see 
the good, the bad, and the ugly uh, as a consequence of embracing these technologies. So I think in terms of governance and our lives as citizens, things are going to change dramatically, uh, also in ways that I think today us three cannot imagine. Thanks very much. Thank you, Sanjana. Nalika, over to you. Thanks, Priyanka. Uh, I want to use the screen for a few minutes uh, for a bit of show and tell, partly because there are a couple of uh, interesting images I want to share with you. Uh, but I want to begin with uh, what Sanjana used in his uh, last sentence, citizenship. The word citizenship itself is uh, derived from cities. And since we are talking about identity uh, and how identity is being redefined uh, with technological change, uh, I want to just for a moment take us back to what, city, what a city means to us. Perhaps this was touched on this morning, unfortunately I wasn't here, but a city at a very basic fundamental level can mean many different things to many of us. And then, as you will note, none of, the, none of the options or answers I've given here has anything to do with urban infrastructure, a dreadful term in my view. view. Uh, I, I think, first and foremost, a city is a state of mind, a frame of mind. Uh, and I will come back to this in a couple of sec uh, slides. It's a dynamic being and a community that keeps changing and growing and adapting. Uh, now, if we take that as the larger idea of the city, how does the, the influx of technology or infusion of technology change that dynamic? I think that's something we should, uh, we should explore uh, in the time we have. A couple of years ago, I, uh, when I was writing a regular column in Ceylon Today, one week I visited this question, uh, raised and tried to answer this. Are there real cities, any cities in Sri Lanka, using that larger philosophical definition of a city or understanding of a city? And, and I placed it in the context of what, uh, what uh, the common answers are, the common characteristics of a city which has to do with uh, going beyond infrastructure, to do with lifestyle, to do with culture, to do with the pluralism that is embedded in many cities, the cosmopolitan nature of cities, and, and, and also the, the last couple of points, the defiance of authority, the sense of irreverence that many cities nowadays are nurturing. Uh, and which concerns and worries uh, rulers. So what makes a city, I asked in that column, and I placed it in the context of uh, this question. These are verbatim, uh, this is a verbatim uh, paragraph from that, I think the key paragraph in my column. Uh, and I said that cities are where many worlds collide, but in a liberal and pluralistic setting, as Sanjana was saying, that's the basis on which smart cities are being developed elsewhere in the developed world. Real city dwellers learn to navigate through contentious issues without aggression or violence. It's the pseudo-urbanites who merely transport their village mindsets along with the feudalistic, along with the feudal, feudalism and intolerance. So this is part of the problem, I argued, I'm not going too much into it, uh, that we have had and we are not unique. Across the straits, this is what an Indian journalist and novelist said about his country's metros, which are many and much larger than ours. Again, Manu Joseph writing after the brutal gang rape and murder of uh, Nirbhaya, the, after the Nirbhaya case, uh, argued in a, in a well-argued uh, op-ed essay that the India has failed to develop any cities that meet the modern definition of a true city. So in a sense, I think in a small, to a small extent, we have the same concern or situation. And this is relevant, I think, in the context of what was discussed this morning, the, the Western regional 
megapolis idea that's now being revived with the technocratic prime minister who was sworn in yesterday. It's a, a revival because he tried the last time he was in office to do this. And already we see the branding and the website wasn't quite working. But I find that on their Facebook page, they are actually soliciting public citizen comments on the nature of the megapolis that we want to see. And this is one departure from the previous administration. Now, we don't know how far this consultation will happen and how much our feedback will, will be taken on board, but at least they are trying to engage. And this is from less than a month ago, about a month ago. And uh, some of the images, and you had the chairman of the, of the authority speaking to you this morning, so some of the images that are shared online look very slick and green. Uh, and already the, the press has started writing about it. But I think what I want to do is to, to pause and ponder, both as planners as well as citizens, particularly of the Western region, uh, where most of us live and work in, uh, are these questions which I want to pose to ourselves today. One is that is a city as we know it, geospatially defined city, is that becoming outmoded with the information and communications technologies that enable increasingly teleworking and telecommuting? The second one is, will communication technologies render the earlier physical hubs such as Colombo's commercial district, concepts like that. Will the communications technologies make these hubs less relevant uh, in the economy as also in society in the coming, uh, coming years, coming decades? Third point is, will the future cities evolve more in social and cultural spheres rather than in strict economic terms? The economic terms will remain important, but will the growth and the innovation and the dynamism happen more on social and cultural fronts? So these are, I think, worth keeping in mind and reflecting on. And what are the implications of this for planning? The one uh, couple of interesting images I want to share is from Learn Asia's uh, mobile network big data analysis, which they've been doing for Sri Lankan mobile phone users using anonymized uh, and uh, aggregated mobile phone use patterns in this country. And one of the insights they have found, and these next three slides are borrowed from a presentation they made to the Institution of Engineers earlier this year. Uh, and uh, all that is also fully available on their website. And, and what they wanted to find out was the redefining of communities as evident from the pattern of mobile phone calls connecting from one to another. If you take all the calls originating in the island of Sri Lanka, the point of origin and the point of termination, and then put it into a lot of data crunching, and this is the map that they found after a few days of data crunching. And the communities, they found there are 11 distinctive communities that talk more among each other rather than across each other. So in the next slide, they have said, for example, that how do these communities mesh with existing administrative boundaries? In some cases, and we don't have time to go into details, but in some cases, it largely overlaps with provincial demarcations, which were done arbitrarily some decades ago. But in other cases, such as if you take the eastern province, Trinco has its own dynamics and community in terms of how they talk to each other. And Batiklo and Polonarua have a common unit connected and linked by their common rice economy, as Lernatia interprets it. Uh, and, and similarly, the, the south and the other parts of the country have these 11 distinctive communities. So these are new insights that are becoming available and possible with this new research tool called Big Data Analysis. And I think these need to feed into some of the transport and urban planning 
that is now being done on a fast track, especially with the new government uh, coming in. So ICTs give new tools, but they can, as Sanjana recognized, and I've been writing and speaking about for many years, they can also exacerbate existing disparities. So the social science perspective and the human rights framework for promoting the te technocratic solutions is vital. And that's something that I think we recognize in gatherings like this, but is not always self-evident to the technocrats who draw and implement policy. Uh, I think I'll, I'll just stop there uh, and bring back to the question, how can we use these insights and these tools to evolve genuine cities and true citizenship? That's the question I want to explore a bit further. Thank you. Thank you, Nalika. Let's lead off with then one, one fundamental and uh, cross-cutting issue that both of you identified this technocratic nature of services, the society, the solutions that everyone from our prime minister to policymakers are attempting. Uh, and you identify there's a gap here, a gap in knowledge, which is those of you, us who understand technology and understand its implications, like both of you, are quite different to many of us who actually use it, far less those who actually design and implement public policy. Um, is there a challenges here in those who are doing it actually understanding and taking advantage and adapting technology to deliver the kinds of solutions both of you are advocating? I think, well, yes, uh, the simple answer is yes, because when Google, uh, when Google Loon, some of you may have read it in the news, uh, signed that agreement, uh, some of the politicians now in power said that everybody's going to get free internet. And it's utter absolute bollocks, complete shit, really. Edit that out, don't. You know, like, you, you, you cannot give free internet as a consequence of Google Loon. Nobody's going to subscribe to Google Loon. So there's this whole aura uh, of misinformation and disinformation uh, created for partisan parochial expedient gain because it was on the cusp of election. And then you have no responsibility to the citizens who consume and believe that, yeah? And that is the tragic history of governance and government uh, uh, in this country, where a critical discussion uh, and a more honest, uh, uh, open, transparent, accountable discussion around policy making is simply not there. But Priyanka, the other thing that's happening and that's quite interesting is that you have innumerable examples in this regard of uh, the worst informed in charge of the policies that affect all of us and probably the most well-informed being marginal or peripheral to that policy-making process. Yeah, and Alec also talked to the, the lack of democracy uh, in those kinds of movements. However, as a consequence, Priyanka, what we are talking about, what you can see is that the discursive, the, the, the participatory frameworks of engagement and discussion and debate occur despite the fact that the policy-making processes are closed. They occur maybe outside of those processes, but it's now increasingly difficult to ignore them. Uh, it, at the very least, these are votes. A politician has to consider that if people are dissatisfied with the policy making that they are proposing, but they are not included in the discussions that the party or government of the day is, uh, is, is, uh, has formulated, it's nevertheless important to acknowledge some of those discursive spaces. They're discussing it on Facebook, they're discussing it on Twitter, they're discussing it on WhatsApp groups, they're discussing it via memes, cartoons, mainstream media, gatherings around wells, around supermarkets, Satosa to Kiel's to Cargill's, and these kinds of conversations, even after the 8th of January, uh, have fundamentally grown. Uh, and again, this is unpublished research data, but uh, we, uh, CPA undertook some uh, research, uh, critical research looking at the kind of ways through which people were talking about politics uh, in the presidential election versus the general election, and people are far more open. One thing that we noticed was there were far more people on Facebook saying who they were going to vote for and why, uh, and why you should also consider voting for them. So these spaces have opened up. So the point is that even though the tendency may be for government and governance to be closed, it is a consequence of technology that despite that, citizens are going to be increasingly engaged, vocal, pushing back, and wanting to have their voices heard. 
and that is going to be an interesting contestation moving forward. One thing that worries me, uh, Priyanka, is that citizens, particularly this year, but generally in the last uh, few years, have been racing ahead of the more organized civil society advocacy groups uh, when it comes to this kind of discussions. Uh, when I say citizens, it's a very broad, amorphous kind of group, but at least some of who are uh, informed and concerned enough. No affiliation to any organization or alliance, uh, they are talking in whatever spaces available or whatever spaces they can price open. Uh, and, and making themselves heard and trying to influence and discuss further. Now, in a sense, while this is happening in, in a very disorganized way, we have some of the organized gr groups, such as professional associations, uh, civil society and NGOs, uh, lagging behind and sometimes even peddling uh, notions of paranoia that are rooted in outdated, outmoded concepts from the 20th century. You know, the north-south disparities and the, the new world information order and all these things that were current in the 1980s and 1990s. Uh, the world has moved on. Technology has changed the nature of the debate. But some of our intellectuals and professionals are still debating using those frameworks. They mean well, but they are sadly out of sync with the reality that some of the citizens and citizen journalists and citizen, uh, citizen scientists are talking about and debating about. So in a way, there, this disconnect is there. And our professionals need to, to catch up, almost, I feel. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to move to areas about access and perhaps the potential for digital discrimination. Um, Sanjana, you mentioned a 57% statistic of people saying that they would use the web and engage more if uh, these services were available in Singhal and Tamil. And before I ask the question, I want to relate an anecdote from some work uh, a few of us did about 18 months ago, which is to bring to the attention of corporate Sri Lanka um, what was going on amongst young Sri Lankans engaging in racism on Facebook and so on, but mainly through uh, in Sinhala and Tamil. Uh, a lot of them are very surprised. They did not understand that this existed. And in part, that got to, spoke to, I guess, a bit of a division in Colombo between English-speaking social media use, especially amongst uh, some of the well-educated and the wealthy, uh, and their lack of visibility of what happens in uh, somewhere else on the island, or perhaps in Colombo itself, but it takes place in Singhala and Tamil. Alternatively, you have the problem you've identified, Sanjana, which is uh, a demand for greater use of uh, access or content, or the ability to create content in Singhala and Tamil. So the question here is, uh, whether we see ourselves as a city, or whether we see ourselves as a country, are we actually talking to each other if there is some kind of language difficulty in doing so? Do we need to be bilingual or trilingual to do this? Uh, and if we're not speaking to each other, uh, does that create divisions of, of, of some kind, at least in digital spaces? We have 20 minutes left, Priyanka. Take You're as long as you like. <laughs> You're not going to get an answer from me or Nalak, or maybe the audience wants to chip in on this as well. I will respond in two ways. One is that you see that new languages have arisen as a consequence of the web and the internet. Uh, and we talked about this. It's not just EST. It's not just English Singhala, uh, English, uh, Singhala Tamil. Uh, it is also the language of memes. It's also the language, I think, one of the things that's going around virally in the morning today is somebody's, uh, I think it's a Dr. Dre rap video uh, or some kind of rap video with Ranil and Mahindra Rajapaksa, and they've kind of used that as the back, background uh, to uh, the, the swearing in. So there's all sorts of forms of, uh, of multimedia, transmedia, storytelling, 
uh, uh, of using memes, of using graphics, of using design, the aesthetics, the language of graphics to communicate political ideas, to critique political ideology, to critique political politicians. So there are new languages that have only been created as a consequence of the web, the internet, and uh, emoticons, for example, or WhatsApp. I mean, uh, I, uh, I have people who I know, and I'm sure many of you do as well, who have no problem carrying on a conversation using uh, uh, minions, for example. Absolutely no problem. A completely coherent, emotional, in-depth conversation. Uh, it might be complete gibberish to anybody else. But that's a way of communicating. That's not English, Singhal, or Tamil. Now, I'm not trying to belittle the fact that we have serious language problems in this country. Uh, and, 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 and they will endure, and, and they need systemic reform. Uh, and, and, uh, uh, and a policy making that takes it seriously. Uh, 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 some of us, including me, were absolutely shamed, appalled, outraged by the fact that the current prime minister chose to put his first message thanking the voting public in only Sinhala. I mean, what is the meaning of this? It's, it's ridiculous. Yeah? So we need to make changes in that regard, but I think that the, 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 the discursive spaces online are not hostage to the same languages that are there outside, uh, like English, Singular, Tamil, they are creating their own languages, they are creating their own space. But to hark back to my first uh, submission, I think there's a risk though of, as you very correctly pointed out, and I think is also very evident in the mainstream media, of us being hostage to the language that we are comfortable with. And us thinking and projecting beyond that, I think, is a risky business. Uh, we must always be, and Alec always makes the point, that he and I are largely unaware of what's happening, uh, happening in the Tamil uh, uh, internet sphere and, and, and in blogosphere and, and basically social media writ large. We don't know as a consequence of us not being able to engage with that language for whatever reason. So I think that um, we are sometimes hostage to the languages that we speak or engage with. Obviously, there's difference and division within those language groups, but we must be very careful to not project beyond and to always be mindful of the fact that we don't uh, have access to some of those uh, spaces. And I think it, uh, uh, it would be interesting for me to see how uh, the new language policies, which now teach uh, Singhal and Tamil to, to school children, uh, uh, are going to inform and influence the way they uh, adapt, embrace, adopt. Uh, these web technologies moving forward as tools of their choice to communicate with each other. Just want to add that uh, this is this is a very rapidly evolving area where empirical research is not really done. So here is a gold mine for social science research on how technology is changing the way we express, where we share, where we uh, protest and and all these dynamics, how they are being changed and and reconfigured with the diffusion of technologies, three million plus smartphones in circulation in particular, and what this is doing to our society and our conversations. So, really, I've been urging my professional social science friends, scientist friends, to to keep on researching in a systematic way what this is uh, doing and what's happening and what it means and what are the implications for broader policy. Thank you, Nalka. I'd like to open the floor to questions. Um, there's a question here up at the front. Nalaka's suggestion that the social scientists and NGOs are still looking at issues of the 80s rather than moving on, using your language, is, an, is absolute bollocks, really. Most of the issues that we currently discuss on Facebook or any other uh, 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 internet avenues are matters that still hang around from the 70s and the 80s. Secondly, matters connected to discrimination. Let me give this example to the panel. Again on social media, there was a, 
a little advert and a plug for Rosie Senanayake that was circulating on Facebook, which I uh, uh, noticed and put my two pennies worth. You should see the sexist comments associated with her, uh, associated with the recommendation from a large number of women who was urging the Prime Minister to nominate her on the national list. The comments were absolutely vulgar in nature, some of them, and sexist. So I think it will take us a long time to grow up and to meet with the expectations and suggestions that the panel are making in terms of where we are going on social media. Thank you. Thank you. Dalka, would you like to respond to that? Yeah, very quickly. Uh, sir, I think you misunderstood. I, what I said, perhaps not very clearly, is that the frameworks, the conceptual frameworks that were used in the 1980s and 1990s, have been rendered invalid by subsequent developments and changes, both in technology and how society adopts these technologies. And therefore, new frameworks are needed and are, in fact, available. But many of our, I didn't say all, many of our researchers are still using outmoded frameworks, which then, of course, uh, doesn't help anyone to, to generate knowledge or to, to further the debate. On uh, the lack of civility in online communications. You are absolutely right, and I've been calling for greater cyber civility uh, as a precondition for meaningful use of technology online, social media in particular. But then the anonymity, people can hide behind either no name or pseudonymous uh, identity, that suddenly brings out the worst in some people. Who, who would say things that would not normally say in, in physical, offline situations and conversations. So this is the big challenge. Anonymity had greater utility, and it continues to have utility when there are repressive regimes trying to track down dissent. So therefore, this is not an argument against anonymity online. But at the same time, anonymity in the wrong hands, lacking in cyber civility, can result in the kind of very sad situation, and there's much worse when it comes to hate speech. Insightful hate speech, absolutely dreadful hate speech online, particularly on Facebook. And this is a collective challenge that, that we all face. I don't have an immediate answer. I would hesitate to call for any state intervention or regulation. This is something we must work out ourselves as a society and, and uh, as users. Do we have any more questions from the floor? This one here in the second row. Um, uh, I have. I have another question for Nalaka. Uh, I think you're absolutely right when you sort of talk about cities as sort of extending beyond geospatial constructs and also being sort of part of a frame of mind. But I kind of want to push back a bit on the idea of. Because you asked, you know, do, does Sri Lanka have a city? If it's sort of defined in a particular way that you know that you you describe, but does the sort of does a city exist anywhere in that case? Because I'm sort of thinking of you know how people sort of describe world class cities like you know New York and places, and they all have these really interesting problems of conflict. Um, and I don't think it's necessarily an issue where you know you have the city dwellers who can exist sans con sans conflict, and then you have these sort of village or sort of an another people with another mentality who are imposing these um, conflicts on the city. Um, so I'd like to sort of ask you two questions. Where, w what would you sort of consider a city in in the way sort of that you describe it? Yes, that would be my question. Okay, uh, it's it's a big question. We could have an offline conversation. What I was saying is that uh, that. It's not the, the lack of conflict, but the way a real civilized community would negotiate and resolve that diversity 
uh, of opinions and the contestation of ideas without physically coming to blows or without getting seriously polarized. And, and that is to do with community cohesion and factors that, that we really need to really work hard on in this country. Uh, is there a city that I find uh, where this is? I'm sure each of us would have our favorite cities. Uh, I think when we look for models, I think it's the wrong model to look at really small city states like Singapore, because the scale is different, uh, way different from ours. I think we should look at comparable. Colombo's city population is less than a million people. And it, it receives on a daily basis, on weekdays, another few hundred thousand people. So it is really small by subcontinental standards. So we need to look at comparable cities elsewhere in Asia. One city that I have found, found charming and appealing uh, for a number of reasons is Georgetown in Penang in Malaysia the state capital of um, Penang State. Uh, cities like that, which are balancing modernity with tradition, with modern concepts of urban management, and nurturing communities. So each one to its own. Every city has to find its own path in modernizing, developing, and becoming a real city. Actually, if I might add to that uh, a bit, I think that it's also interesting, and I forgive me, Nalak, I might have zoned out when you mentioned this, that how we see a city is also not necessarily as a geospatial construct. Uh, I think that's what Nalaka hinted at as a state or frame of mind. Um, if you take the throbbing veins of information technology that all of us are connected to and with and have communications as a consequence of, you can see that the organism that results as a consequence of our digital age transcends geospatial boundaries. And that was very evident in the big data that Nalaka presented. And you might want to then think of a city as an organism outside of, say, the Colombo city limits. And I think that's a very important thing that we need to keep in mind when we are planning urbanity and urban spaces, et cetera. It, it ranges from civic and public life to the way in which land, for example, is planned in a particular city. For example, if I may submit to you a very interesting way art can play a role. If we say, for example, that five, ten years down the line, everybody is going to be connected, you could think, for example, of an artistic installation based on fiber optics at Fort Railway Station. The fiber optics would change color from blue to red based on automatically generated, algorithmically verified sentiment analysis, say across all three languages, of what people are saying on that particular day. So as you leave for the commute or you get out of the train, you're confronted with this colored representation of public mindset. And it's interesting as art because through technology as the basis, because that's also a feedback loop. Uh, the public at Fort Railway Station, which encounters, for example, red in the morning, may wonder why there's such a lot of disenchantment and dissatisfaction and anger, or as a consequence may choose to engage with that. Or if they see blue, then they might be happier. So you know you have these interesting ways of, 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 of also uh, discursive or dialectics of, of engaging with the public and this notion of a city as well, because it's an organism. It's a throbbing, live, embryonic as, as yet, but it's going to grow in ways that I think we need to think differently as well. We don't know how to articulate this even, and we are on the cusp of that. So I think what Nalaka was trying to suggest was that we need to stop thinking about it as brick and mortar and geospatial units. Yeah, and this really scares the traditional urban planners because they don't know what what will evolve in another 10, 20, 30 years. Uh, because all they know is physical geospatial planning. And this is why things like uh, big data analysis of how we connect uh, telecommunicationally is now being looked at this year, Learn Asia has actually had people coming from urban planning and statistical backgrounds in government asking them uh, what this means and whether they can analyze some more big data sets. And big data itself is a relatively new field where research is new and evolving.
Thank you, Nanika. There was a question up here. Okay. So my question leads on from the comments. Uh, so beyond art, uh, how can we define on a digital discursive, discursive space uh, where we transcend language issues? So you were speaking about how essentially all of these sites are based on networks and you can only access certain net networks, whether it's English speaking, Singlish speaking, Tamil speaking. It's those networks are built, you only see shared content based on language. Is there a way, is there a potential uh, where it can be user-led communities where it trans uh, transcends these language barriers? Um, for instance, uh, is there a potential for A, user-led communities or B, certain tools the only tool I can think of is, for instance, Google Translate, uh, where you see now websites in a foreign language being automatically translated to your to English. Um, what is the potential uh, to, I'm asking both Sanjana and Nalika, do you see in the future for this to happen? Nalika didn't get your question. Okay. So I'm going to take a half hour crack at this. Um, I think that there are two ways in which I can answer you. Uh, aside from Google Translate, you have C++, Visual Basic, coding. If we can, and this I think is a project that's worthy of pursuit, if we can encourage a blossoming community of coders to be responsive to, to be involved in, to be engaged with social political problems that they too face and co-create solutions, not wait for government and governance to catch up, but as a consequence of having the privilege of that knowledge, create small apps. When is the next train coming? Where is the next bus? You know, uh, small things that make a big difference. I think that the language of coding can bring people together, not just within and between the tech community, but also with the tech community and people like us who are interested in and involved in uh, uh, discussions around uh, solutions to social challenges. The other is to use technology as well. Again, Google Translate may not be the best, uh, best mean, but I, I take your point. Uh, it's to create technical but also human ways of cross-fertilization. You know, you can have spaces like this where all of us are connected to different networks, physical as well as virtual, but we come together to talk. Can these be continued in Google Hangouts across languages? I had a project last year that had uh, a book being created called Short and Sweet that was the ent entirely the consequence of a web, an appeal on the web that got people chipping in 650 submissions, out of which 110 were published. It was only ever done virtually, but it resulted in a physical artifact. So there are ways, I think, that the networks that you talk about, as well as the virtual and the kinetic, the physical, can be cross-fertilized by innovative thinking, by people who act as bees, as it were, bridge builders. I don't know, and there are a number of ways you could do this, hackathons, meetings like this, web spaces, virtual meetings, uh, co-working spaces, uh, you know, a whole range of things that we don't have time to discuss that kind of use technology to transcend the barriers that technology itself sometimes create. And I think it's a mindset shift as well. Yeah, just to add to that, uh, one area to look out for is voice, how uh, the use of voice increasingly with uh, bigger broadband speeds uh, becoming available, or how that will reshape some of the conversations going beyond those who are keyboard savvy or those who are able to engage through written medium. The other thing is coding uh, for addressing and solving social problems. Uh, there is something happening in the next few weeks that both of us are involved in. A coding for good exercise that a number of uh, agencies are trying to put together. Bring civil society groups who have certain needs identified and bring techies, programmers and coders who could perhaps brainstorm and develop solutions, apps or something else to address some of those problems. And this is happening uh, over the next few weeks in three sessions. The first of which is on actually next week. So the initial session, it's actually called Coding for Good, or Code for Good, Code for Good. If you Google for that, 
Code for Good Sri Lanka, it's already, uh, there's a modest website online. If there are no further questions, I'm just going to ask Nalik and Sanjana one very short question, uh, stemming from the question from the gentleman at the front about the lack of civility in the use of social spaces, and Nalika, your response that we should be slow to invite governments to regulate. That being the case, given that so much of these social spaces are in the hands of the corporate sector and the private sector, and the corporate sector with a particular set of cultural values, say Facebook, which is based in the United States, has a very strong and robust freedom of expression set of values underlying it. Does that mean when a local user from here subscribes to Facebook and uses it, we take on those cultural values? Do we pull back and self-censor ourselves so we do not express ourselves as robustly as, say, an American user of uh, Facebook might? The challenge here is to try and work out who sets the rules, who moderates, and then do global users of Facebook accept that it's essentially an American-driven product and an American set of rules by which we enforce and maintain civility. It may not be the case, but let's have some ideas on this. I'm not even sure if a majority of the 1.3 billion people using Facebook are significantly aware of its American corporate roots. It's, it's become a global, perv globally pervasive space. And where it has its corporate roots and accountability matters little or nothing to them. And in fact, in some countries, such as Indonesia, there are people, when they are surveyed uh, with the question, do you use the internet, they say no. Do you go on Facebook? They say yes. To them, Facebook is bigger than internet. And that is where the totality of their online engagements take place. And, and perhaps there can be a minority well aware of where Facebook is rooted or operated from. But I think it's less and less relevant in terms of the users. Now, where does, in that case, rules of conduct, where do they come from? That's, that's an that's an issue, that's a challenge. For example, when a lot of hate speech is, is uh, expressed through Singhala, the Facebook's monitoring and scrutiny process, as uh, Sanjana found out and other activists found out, is less able to discern what is hateful, what is insightful, because it's a language that they are not fully competent in uh, deciphering. So there are, there are challenges both for them as Facebook administrators and, and then for users. It's a collective Facebook community that has to, I think, develop the norms. In, uh, in Burma, you had a fantastic movement called Panzaga. Uh, it's in Burmese, in Myanmarese, uh, and in English as well. I have stood for this myself where in response to the rise of hate speech in uh, Burma, and in particular the Rakhine state with the Rohingyas, people got uh, a selfie with a flower in their mouth. Uh, very, very simple statement. And they took a selfie and they put it up on Facebook as their profile image. There were even dogs with flowers in their mouth. I mean, you know. So it went, in, it went quite viral. Um, and this was in response to, of course, symbolically saying that I will not partake in hateful, hurtful, or harmful speech, de hate or dangerous speech. But what's interesting, uh, Priyanga, is that as a consequence of the Panzaga movement, which is entirely organic and limited to Burma, Facebook embraced the movement and created emoticons for Burmese to use in their Facebook Messenger that they could download freely and use that were also resonant of the kind of values uh, 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 that the movement was based on, which is you know standing up against hate speech. So here was a company based thousands of miles away being responsive to the needs of a particular community. Now, you can argue, I think it's a large argument, whether civility is the same everywhere in the world. But I think we know what, uh, what it means. I mean, uh, I think we have a basic humanity, Priyanga, that, that, that suggests that if we want to engage with difference, that we have to do it in a way that is respectful of that difference and not seek to hurt, hate, or harm. Um, the wonderful thing about this, for example, I am constantly asked, how the hell do I not say that the comments I don't uh, publish on ground views is not censorship. 
My point is that for nine years, I've been moderating and curating a site that has been very explicit in the kind of tone that we want to encourage people to have to discuss emotive, divisive, hard issues. And I have found that the Gandhian aphorism, if you cannot be or you should be the change that you want to see, applies to the online discursive world as well. If we embrace the kind of language of the people who hate us for what we are and what we do, then I don't think you can move forward. You have to be the change you want to see. And that also means that you have to express yourself in a manner that you want to also get others to engage with you with. Well, on that very Gandhian, humane and civil note, let's bring this session to an end. Thank you very much to all of you in the audience for putting up with us. Thank you, Nalika and Sanjana, for sharing your wisdom with us. Changes and people have to or are forced to move. And what are the disappearing narratives of our city of Colombo and how do we want to see Colombo in the future? I'm really happy to see that our panel is comprised of uh, participants from all generations. So I hope that Mr. Virakun will bring in an aspect of old Colombo, Moratua, Kaluthara, and Panadura, and stories that we have long forgotten or we didn't know about. I hope that Ashok Ferre will talk about Kalpiti or Kulupitiya, as I say. Uh, and Khalik, I know you have an interest in slave island, so I will hope you will talk about how you got interested in the whole thing. Um, I'm going to start with Mr. Virakun first. I know you have a really interesting story to tell us about a house and about people. So can we start with that? OK, thank you, Am Amina. Thank you for that. Uh, it's not on. Thank you, Amina. Thank you for that, those generous words about me, undeservedly, of course. Can you all hear? Can you all hear? Can you hear? No. Not, not enough? Just hold it close, Batman. Um. Hold it very close, they say. Can you hear now? Fine. OK. Uh, here the oldest starts first. And usually, the younger starts and they will go on to the old. But they, I was surprised by Amina. She wanted me to start and start with a story. This whole session is about storytelling. So I'll start with a story uh, of a fabulous person who lived in the latter half of the 19th century. His name was Henry Ch Charles de Souza. And he came from Moratua. And that's the house he built in what is now Bagatelle Terrace or Alfred House, or Alfred Gardens, Alfred House Gardens, all that area of Colombo, which earlier was Cinnamon Gardens, and then went into Colpity or Colombo Three. Alfred House has a very interesting history. But one of the most interesting things that happened there was that in 1870, many, many years ago, Charles de Souza, and his wife, and his uncle, who was also a very rich man, decided to invite the Prince Alfred, Duke of Edinburgh, who arrived in the country on a short visit. This was 1870. And for the first time, a, a Silanese, maybe the governor had done it before, or Europeans had done it before, but here was a Silanese inviting and hosting a prince, a son of Queen Victoria, to a fabulous dinner, which has been described as one of the most extraordinary social events that took place in the country, and perhaps in all of Asia as well. This party attracted 3,000 guests. Most of them would have been locals. There would have been a few Europeans as well. But Charles de Souza, his wife, and this uncle decided that this would be very special and that Prince Alfred should dine off plates of gold. Actual gold, not just gold tinted or gold plated, 
it was gold. He got his craftsmen to carve out gold plates. He got his craftsmen to make forks and spoons which were of gold and encrusted with Sri Lanka's precious stones. So that was the level of opulence that was shown at that time. And I'll tell you later about how this man got so rich. But this is the story really of a lifetime in which for the first time an event of this spectacular nature took place in Colombo. Charles de Souza's estate was 120 acres at that time and believe it, all of it centered around Alfred House where he lived. Around Alfred House he built homes for his children. In addition to making a lot of money, he was quite prodigious in his output of in his fertility. He had 15 children, eight boys and seven girls. And for each of the boys, he made a special house. And these houses were the ones that you see even today as you move along Thurston Road from that very large house that belongs to Boras, the Lukmanjis, I think, which has gates of steel and a huge house in the garden inside. That's the first one you see as you turn on Thurston Road and move up. Just before Queen's Road is his great house, which is called Lakshmigiri. That was for one of the children. And if you look further down Thurston Road at the university on the left, you'd see a very interesting building, which was the University College in my time and your time, and which was, which was one of those things which he built for another child. Redmond, can I just stop you at that point, and I'll get back to the story. He sounds a fascinating man. Sure. And I'd like Ashok to read a passage, because quite fortuitously, he has written about uh, Alfred Soiza's wife. Um, uh, we didn't plan this, but we suddenly realized that there was a connection, so, so we're going to put, put it in this order. It's from my book, Corporate People, and it's a story called Odenard and Malplaqué, Ramilies and Blenheim. Uh, it's, I have fictionalized it, but uh, how it actually happens is my mother inherited the house that Lady de Souza was born in. It was in a, a small village uh, outside Colombo, which over the years has become a suburb of Colombo. It's called Moratua. And, and the house is very, very modest, but rather ancient. It's in the Baroque style, so it was built in the late 1500s. So it's a late uh, uh, 16th century house. Uh, and very, very modest. Um, I'll, I'll read little extracts from this, uh, and, and it is about Lady de Souza. I've never read this story before, so you'll have to excuse me. Then there is me because they all have that particular air of homemade clumsiness that I have come to know and love. I'll skip a bit because I don't want to bore you. I am back at Malplaquet now and the devils are getting worse. I can feel that it is time to take our last bow and leave the stage. The Fisher dynasties have had their quarter millennium of fame when they held this country in the palm of their hand. In any case, I think the rot set in when our descendants moved to Colombo and built themselves palaces, like this one, and generally got above themselves. Their blood is thin now with too much copper and it is poisoning the system. Worst of all, they are losing their once sure touch with money. Back home it is dusk and the devils creep out of the shadows to plague me. In the courtyard of the Buddhist temple nearby, they are drumming because it is poor day. Ros, that, that is the one servant she has left in the house. Ros has put on a spotless white sari, and really she looks stunning, though I would die rather than tell her so. She has filled a city bag full of temple flowers, and there is a faint flush to her cheeks. It is the drumming, I know, that gets her excited. But to me, it means nothing. For you see, my dear, in my mind, I march to the beat of a very different drum. It goes, Odenard and Malplaqué, Ramilies and Blenheim. Thank you. Thank you, Asher. 
That was really nice and it related so nicely to what you said, Bradman. What yes, would, I mean, yeah. would you comment on that? Yeah, I, can, I, can I continue? Yes. I think that was very, very valuable because that, that brings up Moratua, where Charles de Souza came from, and brings up Catherine, who was this Catherine's grandmother. Actually, Charles de Souza, it is said in his autobiography, in his biography, had three legacies. One, his own fathers. Secondly, his uncles. And thirdly, Catherine's legacy. Catherine, as was said in this ex excerpt, was one of the richest heiresses of Moratua. Now, how did the Moratua people get rich? These were, as uh, uh, was already said, these were of the Fisher caste. And the Fisher caste is supposedly in that caste hierarchy, which I don't subscribe to at all. I think they are all very equal, and they are all extremely important, and they all are predominant. The Karava, the Goegama, the Salagama, and the Durava. Those are the four predominant castes. I can give you a breakdown of their numbers later. But these four castes are the ones that controlled agriculture, fisheries, coconut industry, and the cinnamon industry, which were all very important in that era. Now, how did the Karavas get so rich? There is a wonderful book written called Nobodies to Somebodies. I think a very unfair kind of appellation of nobodies becoming somebodies, because usually one is very happy when you move from log cabin to White House. But here the thing seems to be that nobody should not become somebodies. But these nobodies, the Karaba I community... Think, I think, Bradman, the book was written by Kumari Jayawardana, right? It's a social scientist. Yeah, excellent excellent uh, sociologist and so on. But I think she borrowed nobody from somebody from somebody else. So the title was just put in there. However, these people, by dint of their own perseverance and industry, very active, as was said by Ashok in that excerpt, a different kind of people, almost like the Jews in a European setting. These were wonderful people. They acquired wealth. They accumulated wealth. In those days, you couldn't borrow from banks, so you had to do it yourself. They had two main ways of earning money. One was to take advantage of the British offer that while they controlled the monopoly of Arak distillery and distilling, the retailing of Arak should be done by Sudanese entrepreneurs. And when that was opened in about the 1840s, 1850s, the people of Moratua, the, the big ones of Moratua, jumped into it and they became first class Arak renters. They made a lot of money by renting. The other method was, as I've seen in some accounts, they say they went into transportation. Now, transportation is a very high-sounding word. But what was the transportation in that era, 1840? Carts, the simple C-A-R-T-S, carts. Bullock carts. And better, dri driven by two bullocks. So it was called in Sinhalese the Barakarate. It took all the load from the low country to the high country. It took the load for the plantations. It took coconuts, rice, dal, dry fish, and took them up country, earning enormous monies for the owners, but not such a great life for the carters. And you have a whole string of carters' stories, carters' lullabies, carters' ditties at that time, complaining of the huge labor they had of driving this cart and the bulls, and sometimes themselves, up the hill through Haputale and through Kaduga and Nava into Kandy. Now, these people made money. So they made money through Arak renting. They made money through cart transportation. And they used that money to very good purpose. They actually moved their identity, an identity from Moratua into Kalambu. They bought land. Land holdings were very important. With that wealth, they bought 120 acres of land in a prime area of Colombo. Along with that, they went into 
into very beneficial work for others. They became philanthropists. I think you move up the scale from being a trader to being a landowner, and then you become a philanthropist. And philanthropy was his game. He built schools, Charles de Sousa built schools, he endowed hospitals, he created new hospitals, and made a tremendous impression in the social and economic life of Colombo. Thank you, Bradman. That's so interesting. But we're going to go from this really opulent lifestyle of the, of the upper capitalist classes. I would like to hear from Khalik Aziz some stories about his interest in Slave Island. Khalik, how did you get interested? Uh, Why Slave Island? Well, first of all, let me just say it's a real honor to be sitting among such esteemed company and I'm perfectly happy being a spectator with the best seat in the room actually and uh, perfectly happy just listening. I was just engrossed in what you were saying. Um, Slave Island, well for me I guess I don't really, it's really hard for me to say why I'm interested. I've not really been able to quantify the emotional interest I have there. But uh, I am very interested in well, this is where I'm going to talk about boring things and not really delve into an interesting story. But I'm interested in things like economics and history, for example, and how human life works. Uh, and I've always been curious about that since I was small. And I used to have a friend who used to live in Slave Island, and his name was Jeffrey. Uh, and whenever I would go to his house, he would uh, take me from where, where the Navaloka, Navaloka bus halt was, and then you would go through a, a bigish road, and then you go through a smallish road, and then you go through a really, really weird, really small road, and then suddenly you take a right turn, and then there's his house, right? And the weird thing is just beyond, two doors behind his house, there's another small cut in the wall, and that's the railway station. So I didn't really understand how everything connected, right? And how the railway station is right there, the main road's right there. And I didn't really see how I got from that point to this point. And his house also, from the beginning, from the front, it's like a very sort of a old facade and doesn't really see much. But when you go inside, it's a very long house and there are several rooms. And so many people live there. I mean, I think his whole extended family used to live there. But this was when I was in school, and that was pretty much the interaction I had with Slave Island. Then I started working, uh, and when I started working, I obviously started interacting with a completely different part of Kalambu, Bambalapitiya, Kollupitiya, you know, uh, Rajagiriya, the officers, and all that stuff. And these places have nothing in common in terms of at least the initial impression you get about life uh, that you get in Slave Island, right? So when I really started being interested in documenting Slave Island was when uh, uh, in the post for Colombo, we started talking about development, and suddenly now development started to mean that these neighborhoods had to leave, uh, had to go, had to be changed, had to be replaced. Uh, and that's when I started feeling nostalgic, you know, and I can't really connect this nostalgia to something logical, it's just something that I feel. And, uh, you know, then I started just wanting to, I felt, I felt first sorry that this place had to go. Uh, and I also felt really bad that I didn't really get to know it as much as I wanted to. So that's when I really started walking around Slave Island in 2013. And I mean, you, you're from Slave Island, so you probably know all about the place much more than me. Um, so I started walking around Java Lane because that was the place that was um, initially slated to be destroyed. And I started learning a bit more about uh, Slave Island and how it was also relevant to my the, the broader subjects I was interested in. and. Slave Island was, well, it's called Slave Island for a reason, because uh, back, I think, during the Dutch, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, uh, it used to be an island that housed slaves. And they housed the slaves in this island is because there was a riot. See, the Portuguese came, and they had slaves. Uh, and then when the Dutch came, they adopted the same slaves. And then at some point, there was a, a, a revolt among the slaves. and. Uh, I think the governor was assassinated, if I'm not mistaken. And I think the slaves were not Lankan slaves, no? They were Af from the continent of Africa, I think. They were. Mozambique. Mozambique, and we, we call them the Kafirs, right here. And that's also a very worrying term when you come from an Islamic perspective, when you think about what Kafir means. I've always also wondered about what the etymology of that term was. But then that's probably for another discussion. Uh, but uh, so then. When the slaves revolted, the Dutch became suddenly afraid of this community of slaves, and then they used to start to transport them into this island uh, after they were done with work, right? 
Uh, and then after that, uh, now there is no more island, but now Slave Island is populated again uh, by traders who came here at the turn of the, the 20th century, I think. And that is also significant because it was because of Petah that was a um, sort of like a commercial hub. It was a, 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 a hub for, for the word I'm looking for is um, a naval or a, a port, I guess. So that was, it was a trade hub, right? So attracted a lot of traders and these traders, uh, mostly from Indian and Malay origin, came and settled down in these areas because of the proximity uh, to the source of their trade. Uh, and I mean, we were talking about what cities mean in the previous discussion and I think a big part of what a city means is that there is proximity. Uh, there's social proximity but there is also e economic proximity which results from a very strong need to be connected to where the trade is, where your livelihood is connected to. So today, so trade, trade was an initial part of uh, what Slave Island is today. And it's ironic to me because, okay, so you can say it was maybe capitalism that resulted in Slave Island and Java Lane being what it was until a few years ago over the last whole century. And today you have a different form of capitalism coming in. So whereas it was the Desoisas from Morotua who came and bought in properties in Colombo and, and Slave Island, I think the Desoisa building was also theirs, right? This massive building in Slave Island that completely dominates the landscape. But today it's the Tatas. So it's globalized capitalism now. It's not local capitalism anymore. It's a different form of capitalism. It's a different animal that's coming in and taking over these places. So for me, that whole paradigm is very, very interesting. And that's why I'm sort of drawn, I think, to Slave Island as a place in that sense. And you've been documenting them by taking photographs and talking to people. Yeah, I'm a, yeah these are some of my photographs. And these are some of the photos I took at Java Lane. Uh, and I'll just quickly go past them. And these are also at the... Um, at the first floor of the Rio, uh, along with narratives uh, that have been written for the Picture Press. And this on the website, thepicturepress.org, you can check them out. Uh, and this is a chap called Mr. Saldin, who's been there since, well, he's about, he was about 80 when I spoke to him, and he, he moved there when he was about five. And he had like a three-story house that was pretty, pretty much rubble about two weeks after I spoke to him. Uh, you know, and these were people who were established in the area, they were not slum dwellers or illegal residents in any way, which is also a big sort of an issue, a very problematic issue about how we talk about evictions and how we talk about development. And the way we sort of frame these people and how we talk about it, the language itself uh, was very intriguing to me how, I mean, there was a lot of... Because we don't bring the human aspect. We don't it. bring the human aspect of it. It's a very sort of a top-down language that is conditioned a lot by power, condition a lot by the need to wipe out uh, people that are inconvenient in that sense, right? So, so this lady, uh, her name was Nimalavati, and uh, she was actually sort of, she was uh, in sitting in her porch, um, and she looked very despondent, and she told me it was because her, her, her daughter-in-law, who had been evicted from Boralla, was now living with her, and that was obviously, a, I mean, they didn't really get along, and the daughter-in-law obviously got the better of her. So she's been pretty much confined to the porch, and you can look from her expression. I mean, she barely managed to put a smile together for me. And then she was talking about her husband, who was actually a Tamil, and how back when they got married, there was there was really no sort of a, uh, it wasn't really a bad thing for a singer to get married to a Tamil. I, I guess it was uh, many decades ago. Uh, and she was telling me, I mean, how he was. He used to be a good man. Then he joined the military. He started drinking and so on and so forth. And uh, she actually lived at the Desoisa flats. Uh, and uh, they were also, the, the, the whole flats were demolished about, yeah, somewhere in the beginning of uh, 2014. Um, well, there are plenty of stories about these people. You can read about it on, online or at uh, uh, Shadow Scenes. Um, so I'll just show you a quick picture. Well, these are also pictures of how people, I mean, this is also another problem with um, this new, uh, paradigm of how we look at life right now the whole idea of removing these dwellings uh, was sold to us as a way of sort of giving these people better lives so projected through government propaganda and the media was the image of uh, a brand spacking new high-rise apartment 
clean bathroom with tiles and a fully equipped this bathroom. This is for the residents to be to be. Yeah, uh, I'm talking about how, how we generally were told to look at uh, how evictions work. But then you don't understand that the fact that these people are not really used to one living in conditions like that, and also that they have a lot of economies, social economies that they can't rely on when they're suddenly uprooted. Uh, Javelin is also, I think, one of the last. You can correct me if I'm wrong, but one of the last biggest Malay Muslim neighborhoods in the city. Uh, and I, if I'm not mistaken, there's a lot of uh, social and cultural economies where they rely on each other for transmission of their history, of their language, because the Malay language isn't really spoken outside of uh, Malay circles. So That's where it. are all these people now? Uh, I don't really know. I mean, this is something that uh, me and Iromi from CPA were thinking of actually following up, going to these specific families and seeing where they are. But generally, uh, and I think there are people in the audience who have worked on this issue, uh, much stronger than me, but the victims of the eviction process either are still waiting for uh, the promised uh, compensation to come to them or are still waiting for the promised new dwellings to come to them. Some of them have been moved to actually new high-rise apartments, but the process, which was very haphazard to begin with, is still far from resolved. Uh, yeah, so let me just quickly show you the last picture here. So you can see this, is ho this, uh, this whole thing is a neighborhood, right, and full of houses, packed, uh, actually it's a very packed, very crowded neighborhood. And uh, when I went finally for the last time in February, this is what it looked like, you know. So it's just the mosque that was uh, left standing and uh, obviously it was a building that has a very deep and em uh, historic and emotional value. Uh, it was apparently a mosque built specifically for the Javanese soldiers who, who, shot, who fought for the British Raj. Uh, so they wanted to conserve the mosque, and that was allowed, but pretty much everything is uh, disappeared. And I think this is why it's interesting to go to the exhibition at the Rio, because if you go to the top floor, you can actually look over uh, and see Java Lane, and you can see what it is now. It's pretty much, I think, mostly been covered over, and it's a huge construction site. Uh, Harlik, when Bradman and I were chatting earlier, thank you. Uh, we thought that we have gone through evictions and translocation before, right? Can you all remember? Were there any other instances of where people have been moved out of the area, forcibly moved out? Bradman, can you, you said... Uh, I, I can think of uh, certainly two instances. One, where they had to be forced out because of the exigencies of, say, national security. It happened during the war. During Which the, war? Second World War, okay. when you needed, for one thing, you were worried, worried about bombings, and you needed to have zones which would not connect up with other houses. Yeah. Otherwise, everything would, would, would go on and on. There would be an inferno, which wouldn't stop. So they made fire gaps. But the fire gaps were done. Now, that too was rather sudden, without much consultation with people. But at least those people were found in another place quickly. When you say fire gaps, did they break down any houses? They break down houses. That's terrible. Break I never houses. heard of that yeah, before. Yeah, fire gaps. In the 1942 period, you were not bold enough then. I was not born, hopefully. <laughs> 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 so where, was, where did this happen? It happened in the, in the PETA, in the, in the built-up area of PETA, where people lived to shops and people. The other incident was in uh, was a much more humane way of looking at resettlement. It happened during Premadasa's time. Premadasa's pre president was very concerned with housing. And he had this caring uh, feeling about people. He knew that people lived in slums, or waters as they are called, because they wanted to be close to their economic source of income. And that's the major thing, I mean, as, as you were saying, Halik. And he realized that in Vanata Mulla, which is near the, the Tara Union Cricket Club and all that, he realized that he couldn't do this, cleaning it out and giving the land to somebody else. He actually gave the land back to them, but consulted them also about the manner in which they would find it still agreeable to live there. The houses were built with their consultation. So they were houses and not high rises? No, they were not high rises. But they I were, think at some point there were some Maliga Vata flats. 
I think there were high rises and people were displaced. And the same thing, you know, Khalik, I mean, I'm older than you, so I remember this yeah. conversation that also happened amongst the Muslim community. Because I think we forget that actually Colombo has a large uh, Muslim popula population, most of them the underclass. Uh, Could I just add please. two things to this? Uh, uh, in my career as a builder, I've realized one thing. If you have a house and all your memories are there, and you lift it brick by brick and put it somewhere else, for some reason, it goes. Your, your attachment, the, you cannot transfer the atmosphere and your love and whatever you have. I know because this house I, I spoke about was demolished. And I wrote this story at the time it was being demolished. I'm just about to revive it somewhere else. But I know it will not be the same thing. So you know, when you move these guys from their houses, from that atmosphere, no amount of recreation will, 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 will sort of bring but that But I'd back. also like to flag another kind of move, which is not forced, but it is a voluntary move. But it is also people who can't afford to live in Colombo, who are selling their houses, which are being demolished, and they're moving into flats. So we have many kinds of, uh, I mean, there are people who are saying they're not used to living in flats, but then they have to go because they can't survive. Khalik, what do you think about that? I don't know if you can see the connection, but so you have people who are being made to move out because the land is valuable and uh, too valuable to be in this state, I suppose. Yeah. Well, I think also some people voluntarily sell their land because it's valuable, like in the Gulf Fort, right? I mean, you have people selling their houses for hundreds of millions of rupees and then coming and living in the lap of luxury in Colombo, at least buying good houses in very respectable neighborhoods. Uh, I don't really think. Anyone, I don't dispute the fact that change needs to happen. And the funny thing is, I don't think even the people who are evicted dispute the fact that change needs to happen, because how the change was uh, enforced. See, it wasn't a voluntary change. I think even when someone faces circumstances in which they need to sell and leave, they feel a sense of empowerment in the sense that they made the decision, right? I think there's a difference between making that decision yourself and then having that decision imposed upon you. Uh, which is what, to me, is the biggest problem with the evictions agenda, right, in that sense. At an earlier session, I don't know if any of you all listened to it, which was about the, the megapolis plan. Uh, it wasn't very clear, and we didn't get much information, but I think a lot of the audience emphasized that there needs to be a consensus. You need to have discussion with the people who are involved, with the stakeholders involved. Otherwise, it's really not fair. Sorry, my, my second point was this, that, that, that uh, uh, you do have to have social housing. There has to be a certain amount of social engineering to, 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 to house people and give them decent accommodation. However, um, in much of Europe, the social housing which won architectural prizes in the 60s, I certainly know this of London, those blocks of flats are being demolished now because people just simply cannot live in them. There's vandalism, there's drug, drug use, uh, uh, the, the children grow up completely That's a very good point, actually. That so they could it, become crime centers because of the... So in a sense, we, we are making the mistakes that they made 40, 50 years ago. Khalid, you also made another point, which I, which I twig which is that you thought Slave Island was really different from Kolupitya and Babalapitya and uh, Valavatha. Uh, does uh, Bradman or Ashok like to flag that? What was it like before? They would have had their very clear identities earlier. Yeah, I, I think that this brings up the whole question of what are called slums or vattas. I, I don't know whether everybody knows that of the about two thirds of the population of Colombo municipality apparently live in butters, live in these slums. That's a phenomenal figure. That's higher than that, Bombay yes, because that, we talked earlier about half of Bombay lives in slums. In slums, half. The, the little, yeah. So it's it's really gone. It's those people you know who, who are living in the slums who are evicted generally when it comes to this. Because the, that's the space that is available has been taken by them. But the important thing is that you find a way of dealing with them in a, in, in a, in a reasonable manner and not just throwing, throwing them out completely. You can keep them again close, if possible, to their economic source of income. Where did they get their income from in the first place? Uh, could I just like to add something there? Um, I'm always obsessed 
when I travel to other capitals of the world and see which ones actually work and which ones don't. And sadly, I think Colombo doesn't work. And there's a very good reason for, for this. When much of it was laid out in Edwardian times at the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, uh, essentially laid out by the Brits, but it was also a world fashion. There was this fashion for garden cities, which meant big plots of land, big gardens, large trees. Okay, that sounds really good in principle, but bad mistake. Because the, the one thing that makes a city work is the fact that you're able to walk everywhere on your two legs. You need to be able to go and buy your bread in the morning, your milk. You need to have a school nearby, walking distance. You need to have a cinema, a place to eat, etc. All close by. Now, this works in Venice, in Rome, in Paris. It doesn't work in Colombo because the distances are huge. To go from your house to my house, 10 minutes on the road. You know, it should not, it should not be... Uh, these distances are too large. So the plots that were laid out initially were too large. So anyway, you're giving a wish now because people are building on, they're subdividing and dividing. Yes, and so in, we're in, having in, in a strange way, it's not a bad thing because you're increasing the density. A really successful city has to be dense, uh, such as such as Slave Island or Manhattan, where you can walk everywhere. I'm not sure I agree. <laughs> I agree, Achok. That's but, a bit but frightening. I, I, yes, but, but it really does seem to me that if you can walk, I mean, it's got to this strange stage where we, we Colombo people, we get into cars to go and buy our bread. We're ashamed to be seen walking on the pavements. Of course, the pavements are terrible, but that's, that's another question. I won't say anything about that, the pavements. <laughs> so, you true, know, true. in Canada, uh, Khalik, you might like this. I came across something called Community Land Trust. Have you heard about that? So that is where a government citizen venture, where a certain percentage of housing is kept affordable for low-income residents. So, and that is what Colombo had, I think, with these vattas all over. Even Barnes Place still has a vatta. So what you are saying is that the... the the whole nature of how Colombo is, is changing so fast and so uh, in such a draconian manner that you're not going to have any of these low-income housings in the city. Well, I, I don't know if we are, we are not going to have any low-income housing because low-income housing is low-income housing because there are low-income people, right? And I think low-income people are essential for Colombo to work because that's where you get your informal labor from, right? Colombo is not just about rich people. I mean, if two thirds of the people living in Colombo are living in low income housing, then that means they, they are probably the people who make the city run and work. And if they disappear, then the city wouldn't really start function, right? That, that's one thing. And for me also, I mean, it, it's problematic for me to then start talking about what a, shitty, what a, what a city should be. Yeah, it could turn into something like that also. What a city should be and how it should be and it should be like this, it should be like that. Because then when you're talking about what it should be, then you're starting to dictate terms, right? And then you have to start wondering what gives you the right to sort of start dictating terms and start conceptualizing what a city should be. And um, this is what the current sort of way of looking at cities bothers me is because it's coming from a very uh, sort of a neoliberalist capitalist sort of uh, vision where you're looking at a city purely in terms of markets and labor uh, right and you're this is also my issue with how the megapolis project will turn out i missed the discussion unfortunately but a megapolis essentially is something that is completely geared towards economic efficiency and economic production and everything else sort of takes a back seat to it no matter how then for me it's about not whether the city changes or how the city should be, but about what are the forces that are dictating what the city should be like. Is it the people? But if it is the people, then what does it mean? How would that look? You know, or is it the government? Is the and then how? What are the interests of the government when they do it? And uh, I think I don't know if this government is going to be any different to the last government in terms of its vision. At least I'm not talking about its methods. At least I'm talking at least in terms of. Uh, its broad economic vision, which is very much in line with how we all look at growth and progress today. But I don't know how that is really going to translate into Colombo and what Colombo will be. So I don't want to really take it like a prescriptive standpoint and say that this is what it should be, but just sort of look at it and say this is what it is and what are the things affecting it in a, in a certain way. 
Um, uh, you're quite right. We, we can't dictate terms and say this is how it should be. But it's quite interesting to look at other towns and see where they fail. And earlier on, we had Narish Fernandez, who I'm not sure he's in the audience, uh, who, who writes about uh, Bombay, where uh, plainly the city is creaking because it's a, it's a city of 12 million people and it, it fails to work. And what is happening is that the rich are turning in on themselves, raising their walls, having little gated communities, and, and, and the poor are just next door with, with the slums, the sewage, open, open sewage, and, and, and the rich are going up and up and, and actually walling off the poor. So, so in a way, that closeness will destroy the city. So you, it, it really does need to be open. It needs to be mixed because you always need the poor and the rich side by side. Uh, uh, but as to how one gets there without, uh, I personally feel that to cities have a, a convenient size, uh, an optimum size, and if it goes beyond that, then, then the services fail to work, everything has, I mean, the, the transport fails to work, and so on. And one of the things I, I object to in Colombo is that, that the public transport is so bad. Uh, because the distances are huge, you're forced, you cannot walk, you have to take a bus, and, and nobody does take a bus. I mean, you really struggle when you take a bus. I know, I, I do occasionally. Bradman, I'd like, I'd like a small departure from, because I'm sure we'll have many questions about it. What do you, what do you think of the changing face of Colombo, from your perspective? I, I, I would have liked Colombo to always be that place where you could get to things quickly, and easily, as Asok said. It has to be like home. It has to feel like home. How do you make a city that's growing feel like a place which is familiar and a neighborhood for you? I would like it like that, because that's what I was born to. I think in, in those days, allow me this transgression, this, this tangential thing, they were able to have two homes. If you look at the De Souza thing, they had their mansion here, and they had their Walaua in Moratua. So like that, the richer ones had this ability to, from time to time, get back to that home place. This is a city where you work, where you earn your money, where you do a profession. But that's where you live. It's a kind of commuter thing. It was possible even in the days of horse and carriage. So it's probably possible today, too. One other fact, Ashok, is that of all the cities in the world, I think Colombo shows a very low rate of increase of population. It's done that because it increases its daily population by an ingress of people who come only for the day, and lots of day workers who go out. Maybe the city's population is 1.5 million in the day, and back to about 800,000 in the night. So that's our way of doing it. And contrary to what you said, Ashok, and you have to hang on to trains and hang on to buses, transportation is there. You can go in and out very quickly. People can commute from Gaul, for example. How do they manage to do that? And they live out there. So they're still accommodating. Maybe every culture, every society, depending on its needs, manages to find some accommodation. Sri Lanka, Colombo has been accommodating to that kind of change in that way. Uh, further point, what about all those huge expanses of land owned by security people, security forces, government departments? The railway department earns enorm has an enormous extent of land available unutilized around the stations, across those little stations, lots of land. So that is the way to go if you want to save the land. And then what happens when you have the port city? I want to introduce that one too. You have a port city and the enormous amount of infrastructure that goes in there, the services that the port city will demand. So what are your feelings on the port city? No Yay port city. or nay? Nay. Khalik, yay or nay, Port City? I don't know really. I mean, if it pops up, it will be interesting to see. Yeah. Definitely yes. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, uh, simply, simply because it's close by. 
so people can live and, and walk. Of course, I certainly don't want it to be a gated development just for rich people. It needs to have 25% set aside for, for, for modest dwellings or whatever. It, it cannot just be a rich development. I mean, that's, that way lies ruin. And the whole point is physical closeness. I, I don't like this idea of urban sprawl and having to commute all the way from Gaul to Colombo or Candy to Colombo. Just imagine spending two hours on a train in the morning, two hours in the evening. Your quality of life is zero. Thank you. I think we've had a very interesting conversation. I'm going to open it up early for questions because I think we have a very vibrant and interactive audience. So it will be one question at a time because I can't keep all the questions in my head. So any questions? The gentleman in front here. My, uh, I've got two questions. I thought it through. I hope you let me ask those two questions, Chair. Uh, my both questions are for Bradman, who has been in public life for many years. Now, he spoke about two issues. One was about uh, Colombo in his days, and he also said about uh, the forced eviction, and he also spoke about how Colombo evolved over the period of time. Now, my first question is, when he became a permanent secretary, or cabinet secretary, that was the role I remember him when I was in primary school, he was, uh, how was, uh, uh, Colombo was a multiracial, multi-religious community which consisted of all sorts of people, including immigrants from India, the Jewish community, the Malay community. And there has been forced eviction because of political actions. Forced eviction in your time would have been 1958, where the Tamils were forcefully evicted. And then it went on to 1983. I, I think he also played some role in advising the government at that time. Again, there was significant force eviction. Now, how, what was your advice to the cabinet at that stage uh, about uh, harmony and how they could preserve, preserve the multiracial philosophy of Colombo in the future, especially in your time advising the the, the SWRD Bandar Naika, who was one of the principal architects uh, of this, uh, the, the separatism, or whatever you call it, the nationalism at that time. And what was your advice to him? Did you envisage Colombo uh, going through this massive transformation of force eviction? And do you now think, because of the uh, uh, growth of the city and the investment that we are all expecting under the new government, do you believe it will evolve greater to a multiracial and a harmonious city like the rest of the cities in South Asia? Thank you. That's, that's, that's a profound question, really, and it, it affects me personally. It's what did I feel? How did I advise and so on? Yes, I've stood all my life for, as I said earlier, equality and for the multiracial, multicultural, multilinguistic, all the multis that we can think about. But that's life. That's the kind of life I want. And perhaps in a way, I too am a product of that multi thing. So it's part of my upbringing and my wish that Colombo be like what it was. But political change occurred. I don't think that 1958 did not get that such a bad kind of eviction. But 1983 was a horrible experience. And I had to live with that for one year because I was made Commissioner General of looking after these things. And I can't get it out of my head. All those people who were either in refugee camps and later out in the Vani 
or in Batiklo or Trincomalee or Jaffna because they happened to be the wrong race. That was a, a dreadful period of our life and I think we are still bearing the consequences of that. It, has, it isn't over. What is our diaspora abroad except those who went in great depression in 1983? So we have to live with it. We got to, we can't still erase it from our memory or from our experience. And I think that's the problem that we are facing. But most governments come up and say over and over again, we are for this kind of multiracial society. What needs to be done is bring it into effect. Do things which actually turn the words into deeds. We've been very deficient on that. We're very good on the rhetoric, but rather bad on implementation. Some of us try, but you know, in a way, the, the total culture, the total society has been impregnated with this notion of separateness. Separateness because of the northern problem, separateness because of people who want to defend themselves against the separateness taking effect here. So it's a huge problem. I mean, it's not something that will be solved easily. Uh, we've got to live it through. Each of us has to work our own individual way at seeing it through. So perhaps both of us are on that equally. We'll try and do it together. But to get the whole society to agree is quite another thing. Governments can come up with policies, but people must accept that. Look at the, the tirades against the Muslims, what goes on from time to time. Totally unnecessary things happen all speared and engineered by elements who again want separateness. Let's make this ethnically clean, as it were. You can't live in that kind of a society. It's not practicable. I could not have imagined a better segue to what Khalik is going to talk about religious violence. Uh, well, yeah, let me just go through a few photos actually I took uh, last year, this again uh, for ground views. Uh, this was actually a, a signboard and as you can see it's a very sort of well established signboard, clean, nicely painted wood and hammered onto the wall, a very permanent sign. Singhala nudanna ballanta avavadeyai, ahunut guti. That means uh, <laughs> Uh, this is a warning to all dogs who don't know Singhala. If we catch you, you're going to get beaten up, pretty much. In, in, and this uh, is right next to something written on a wall, says Kunida Vannepa. So the person who actually put this sign up was much more determined to actually make sure the sign stood out. But this was on, uh, at Maharagama actually, which is uh, just outside the uh, outskirts of Colombo. Uh, and, uh, well, this is also another picture I took as part of the same series uh, in the sense that this is, I don't know if you find this disturbing, I don't particularly find this image disturbing, but uh, the Muslim community became the biggest target of uh, post-war uh, religious intolerance uh, and I think a lot of it was actually imported Islamophobia not really homegrown in that sense. I don't really think, from what I've studied, you can correct me if I'm wrong, that the Muslim community and the majority community have sort of had a deep sort of rift uh, historically to sort of warrant this in that sense. But what was actually brought out was the fact that one of the primary reasons for this um, disturbance was uh, displayed as being the, the changing nature of the Muslim community, which is becoming Arabized in that sense. Now. I'm the first person to advocate any sort of dress that anyone should think about. Uh, I do really don't have a problem in the way anyone should uh, uh, express themselves religiously, but I think there is one thing that also came out of this was that the Muslim community themselves started asking questions that they should have been asking from themselves uh, for a while now and started having an internal dialogue and critique that was also relevant as a, as a part of the whole debate of Islamophobia around it. Um, so basically what happened was, I, I think the, the previous session touched on it a lot about online hate speech. And uh, this is where it was very interesting because the previous session was very relevant to this where you have an, inter an intersection of the virtual and the real. 
and you saw it very clearly when it came to uh, the online hate speech aspect where basically people learned about Muslims and learned about patriotism and what it means to be Sri Lankan in the post-war climate through the internet. And I think this is a big problem with uh, how we study history. If you ask a school, school kid who, uh, I mean, how did we get independence from the British or to list all the kings in Sri Lanka from, from the time of Vijaya, if he's a good student, he'll probably be able to rattle off a long list of names and dates. But you ask him about the JVP, you ask him about 1983, you ask him about recent history in Sri Lanka, and he'll come up with a blank. I mean, I, I myself learned about 1983 from Shyam Selvadure's book, and it really disturbed me when I first read it. I didn't even know it was so traumatic or something like this even happened, you know? It's really disturbing because that's how I think a lot of young minds got indoctrinated into hate speech. Uh, so yeah, I mean, as for the causes, I don't know. I mean, this is something that uh, you mentioned in the earlier panel uh, also, that a lot of this dates back to what happened in the 50s, 60s, 70s. And this is actually a, uh, a hotel that used to be, uh, yeah, yes, uh, and very significant building because Mr. Bandar Naik was shot down there. Uh, and that was an incident that was, I mean, a lot of people connected to the origins of, of uh, racism, at least in the modern context in Sri Lanka. So. I tried to explore all these questions and I found out that a lot of racism that we are facing today are also very, very deep scars and have a lot to do with what we consider to be Sri Lankan, how we view ourselves, you know, as people of Colombo or, or as Sri Lankans. We don't really know, you know, there's a lot of mystery. I mean, you, you mentioned about, you mentioned also how you have like the state that can actually advocate and bring in policies, but then how, how will the people react to it in that sense? And what is the problem there? That is something that I've never been able to puzzle out or not really been able to clarify. What is the real identity crisis that we have that is triggering this? I mean, if all these plasters aren't working, there has to be something at the bottom. I don't know, maybe you have some insights into it. Bradman, do you have something to... <laughs> yeah. yeah, I think it's, it's all misguided history. The history of this country being one, so the, where the single is only lived. And everybody else was an interloper, an intruder. The Tamils were intruders, the Muslims were intruders, the Catholics were intruders, you know, and so go on having a list until finally you get the clean person. It's a Buddhist Sinhalese. And the country is for them. If you look at all the myths of the Mahavamsa and so on, you see that going right through. And when people say but it's also a concerted effort in modern government, Bradman, because we don't read the Mahavamsa. So the history books, the history that is taught today is pretty much the same thing. So uh, state has to take a lot of responsibility as well. State and the society which was built by that state. Say the education system, the, the big schools, the nationalist kind of schools. Very few of the schools were the liberal schools who went after the ideal of an equal society. Most were the predominant people here must be the Sinhalese. Sinhalese. Land for the Sinhalese Buddhists. Land to occupation. Everything for one group. And if that group consists of about 70-75% of the country, then you have a Herculean task of changing it back. Because everybody else is in the minority then who's opposed to it. So it's not easy to clear in one generation, in, in, in one era. But a solid thing has to be started by people like us who, who believe in something else. Can I go back to the questions? Does anyone else? OK, there's a young lady at the back wearing pink. Hi. Um, so I have uh, two questions, really. One is to you, Sir Bradman, because we, I was born in, sorry, you can't hear me? This is better. So I was born in the late 80s, and I think from that time onwards, we always had this Sri Lankan identity that was based on your ethnicity. So whenever I travel anywhere, people ask, always ask me, what are you? Recently, I decided I'm going, just going to say I'm Sri Lankan. I'm nothing else but Sri Lankan. And I feel like there are these wonderful stories of what the Sri Lankan identity was. And that was all pre-80s. 
And I would love to know what, as a society, we can do to bring back that sense of Sri Lankan identity. You know, not I'm a Muslim or I'm a Moor or I'm like Tamil Singhala. Like none of that is Sri Lankan. Just a Sri Lankan identity. Like we talk about the state involvement, but what can society do to bring back that sense of Sri Lankan identity? When someone asks you what you are, you say I'm a Sri Lankan, and that's good enough. The other question was about 83. I think because I was lucky enough to be in a fairly liberal school, I knew about 83 riots, like what happened, and I read about it. But honestly, any children born in the 90s don't don't know unless they're Tamil, and that's terrible. So what can we do for all of our children to know what happened at the time with 83, with um, the JVP time, like Harlik said? Like, we need to know these things. We can't forget them and not learn those lessons. And so what do you think needs to be done for those to, to be known? I just want to intervene here. I attended another series of talks on transitional justice. Uh, I think Ground Views held that talk. And actually, there was a very interesting panel on memorialization of, of uh, violent events. So now that does relate to the city of Colombo also. How do any of you all feel about remembering the 1983 riots or any other uh, pre or post by having memorials put up? Bradman, what are your thoughts on that? Because that's also remembering and remembering. never forgetting. Remembering what happened. But that's been almost a constant going on thing with lots of groups who write books about it, write articles about it, have workshops on it. But the city has not done it. The city, in a way, is a, a microcosm of a macrocosm. The macrocosm is this whole state of Sri Lanka, which you are talking about, but which isn't Sri Lanka. It's the separateness of groups and parts. That's what comes through essentially. And in Colombo too, we'll have the same thing happening. It's just a mirror image of the whole. And you have within Colombo these various groups. And you have all kinds of subcultures within the Colombo culture. I mean, that's quite obvious to any of us who've seen it. Eh? I mean, all the time, except for a very fringe on the top, who might speak in terms of commonness and getting together, reconciliation, most of the others are quite comfortable to be without that Muslim shop, don't let a Muslim buy in our property, in our, in our lane. I mean, these are the things that go on under the counter. It's the, the subterranean conversations which go on in all societies. So how do you get over that? Uh, sure. um, I would like to say that I've always maintained that Sri Lanka has one of the most complex societies in the world. It doesn't look like it. We're quite simple-minded, really, on the surface. But, but, but it is an extremely complex society. And the problem with uh, what the questioner asked, I mean, uh, one of the real problems here is that no two people will ever agree about any historical incident. There are four, five, six, ten different stories that come out, and each is given equal validity. So no two people will agree. So everybody subscribes to their very own myth that that belongs to their community or whatever. There are the people who will say, well, yes, that's a massacre, but it was necessary. There will be others who will say there's something else. You know, it's horrific when you think about it that that actually happens here. But it does. So as a result, Halik here, who doesn't know about the 1983, you know, he will not be told the truth because the truth is never told here. What that border means, like Africa was divided uh, on a table into different parts, into different countries in Europe, and they ended up putting tribes that have been warring for centuries into the same space and expected them to then start having, start having collective identities. So identity is a massive problem, and then actually imposing this identity on Sri Lanka, of Sri Lanka on us also, I think, is a little violent in that sense. Personally, I think we should be free to form our own identities based on religion or philosophy or interest in music. Or we have our own um, predominant notion of what we are built by or constructed by, and that, I think, 
shouldn't be changed. But I think the problem then lies with values, right? I mean, if we are living in a society where everyone is cutthroat, and this is why, this is what I'm afraid of what Colombo will become, if it starts becoming more and more materialistic, and I start noticing uh, things like what you see in the India and, and places like China happening in Colombo in terms of how people are starting to view life, how state of people are starting to view careers, and so on and so forth, we are losing that island mentality that we are both in love with and also like to curse, <laughs> right? Uh, if we are becoming more and more cutthroat, then our values, what is going to happen to our values? And I think the biggest problem is the values, not the fact that we have conflicting identities, because if we have good values and principles that are dictated to us by all our faiths in this country, it doesn't really matter if I call myself a Muslim or you call yourself a Buddhist, both our faiths tell, it, tell us to actually respect each other and live with each other, right? So in that sense, uh, I think it comes down to values and a serious breakdown in morality in society that results in these issues. And this is a pattern that I've noticed, uh, even the Islamophobia and the intolerance started when the economy started flatlining, right? And you notice a lot of the hate speech coming from the burgeoning middle classes, not from the upper classes or the lower classes. And that's something that was very clear in, in the internet uh, when you actually look at the patterns. So it's very worrying, and we should also connect these issues of conflict to very real economic issues and how people wrestle with each other in society in that sense, I think. Thank you. That's a good answer, Khali. There, uh, sir, I note your question, but I'd like to give him a chance first and then. Um, just to pick up the point you made about memorializing, uh, because that's not something we've done. In fact, we've done the opposite during the last five years. We've wiped the slate clean. We have a brand new uh, city, uh, glistening and uh, shiny, and uh, nothing to worry about. It's, it's all yeah. under control. Um, the, uh, but I think what Colombo Scope is doing today is really important at the Rio Hotel. The Rio Hotel was built in 1979, burned down in 1983, and has remained that way ever since. And that is a living or a dead memorial of what happened, the, the ethnic violence that happened in this city. And the fact that today we are using this space, and it has begun to be used over the last couple of years for, for theater, for, for art, and today, uh, probably uh, the largest scale uh, of usage today is really a memorialization of what happened. And it's being presented in its original state of, of uh, destruction. It's not being kind of uh, whitewashed. Uh, it's not being presented as a, uh, a pretty uh, piece of uh, abstract art, it's just as it is. And this way of using it will also, I mean, if you were to build a formal memorial, if you were to build a formal memorial, I'm sure you would br bring out the hate speech all over again. Whereas this way of, in a very subtle way, uh, remembering what happened, the, the horrific events that happened, and which we are all responsible for, is, is I think, a really fine way of memorializing this awful aspect of our history, which we have tried to kind of ignore all these days. Thank you. But we have to record that it's an individual's effort, and because it is privately owned, and if it changed hands or once it's no longer in his hands, we have no we don't have any control. So the state refuses. We have individuals who might memorialize, but you never know what will happen after that. Thank you. There's a gentleman in front here who asked the question before. Anyone else? Thank you. Again, uh, uh, the, the race rights in Sri Lanka was uh, was also happened during the the British's time. I think Bradman will be able to throw some light. The 1914 uh, Muslim Sinhala riots took place in the south of Sri Lanka, and the British suggested that it was because of battle for trade, but it was the British who. Uh, uh, incited 
racism among the races. I mean, that's what I am told uh, by historians. Now, coming back, I had a head t uh, principal in school called Dudley K. G. D. Silva. He was a, an, uh, a principal in my time at Royal College. He told us one day, you can only change society by making sure that people behave properly. And the only way that you can get people to behave properly is by applying deterrence. So he is to occasionally cane us if we don't fall in line and behave. Now, I don't agree with caning. But Do you have a question, a, sir? Yeah, the question is, uh, uh, is the second way of changing people's behavior, like what Brendan suggested, Bradman, uh, Mr. Bradman suggested, is by changing people's attitude towards each other. Now, in 1994, I know, during Bradman's time or after, when he was a cabinet secretary, there was a massive change proposed in how we apply uh, uh, a multiracial uh, education system. And there was also a lot of resistance from bureaucrats at that time. Now, can you throw some light on that? And if that has gone ahead with stringent laws to curtail behaviors of racism, could we have had a better Sri Lanka today and could we have a better Colombo in the future if we apply those principles? Actually, I'd like Khalik to answer that because of the hate speech. Oh. I, isn't there a hate speech law or regulation that has been uh, passed? I am not sure if the law was passed, but uh, there was talk of a law being passed. I'm not sure if it was actually legislated. Uh, and I think there's a big problem with legislating hate speech because when you say hate speech, you're you're walking a thin line of uh, a fine line of you know denying free speech right and then how do you quantify what hate speech is it's a very problematic uh, situation uh, i mean there are scholars scholars like susan benesh for example uh, she talks about dangerous speech so leave aside hate speech but when hate uh, when hate speech comes to a level when it can start inciting violence that's when you need to start stepping in so for example in Rwanda, there was a lot of hate speech and racism, but it became dangerous when, for example, there was incitement on the radio stations for uh, the Tutsis to be attacked, right? Uh, and in Sri Lanka, you saw that in Aludgama, when there was a lot of hate speech, but then it became dangerous, went to a whole new level when that rally of the BBS was allowed to happen near Darga town, when everyone knew it was going to be a very, very tense situation, and it was pretty plain than what was going to happen. And that was an instance of da dangerous speech. So I don't know about regulation of speech. Then you're going into a slippery slope, and especially when you're talking about a government regulating speech. I mean, I don't know if we can really trust the government to use that uh, altruistically in that sense. So I think on, uh, just to clarify about hate speech, hate speech was the law, or the amendments to the law were passed. And I think one of the actions was being a charge against the president or the secretary of the BDS. You know, the, that, that the priest was charged with an offense. I don't know what happened to the, to the case, but at least he was brought to trial, which is one, one aspect of it. But I do agree with Harim that there are a lot of, sh a lot of areas in which the state must be very careful about the application of that. It itself in encourages sometimes communal feeling. On the question that you raised, you know, and the possibility of the education law or the education reforms being so implemented that one goes through the whole business of rewriting history, rewriting syllabuses, educating the educators, like teachers. Teachers can be a, an enormous source of uh, you know all of the wrongs that you want to correct, but that's the history they know. So it's an enormous task. It's not only going down to the school, but taking up the the neighborhood, taking up the parent-teacher associations. It's so huge. You know? 
but it's the start. But that's why it is at least for the next generation that they may call themselves Sri Lankan. And it may not only be limited to flags and cricket. Cricket is very Sri Lankan. I must admit that there's a small aperture there in which people really think of themselves as Sri Lankan, particularly when they fight against Pakistan. <laughs> That's Sri Lankan. So some symbols, flags in a distorted way, anthems also in a distorted way, but you have an anthem and you should adopt them to sing in Tamil also. You know, that's the true way. But true. people will say, no, the, singer, the anthem must be sung only in Sinhala. So again, you've got conflicts as Ashok said. I, to add to that, there is actually one very simple way. Uh, if you're talking about education and speech, and it's so blindingly simple, I, 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 I hardly dare suggest it. Why is it not possible that every single child in this country is not taught Sinhala, Tamil, English? Now, in Switzerland, Johannes there is from Switzerland, everybody is taught German and French, and most, most uh, pick up English along the way. Why is that not possible here? Uh, when, when you're taught it at a young age, it's very simple to pick up a language. It's much more difficult at my age, but as a child, it's so simple. If we did that, at least people would be less likely to have hate speech, less likely to, because they take kind of refuge in their own language. So, I, and, and that is something governments could do. Is that, is that, sorry. There actually is a policy on, on teaching all three languages, Sinhala, Tamil, and English, to the Sinhala child or the Tamil child. Is it compulsory? Is it compulsory or just voluntary? It's compulsory at the lower ages, up to about the sixth grade is compulsory. So they are learning at least the script. I, I'm, I'm very close to one of those families and I see the child struggling with Tamil but again learning to recognize the similarity, the commonality between the languages. What's not emphasized is the commonality. The two languages are very similar but it makes the difference so important that it doesn't get done. But there is a, we are moving in that direction. Thank you, everybody. You know, when you have Mr. Bradman Virakun here, it's very difficult to not talk about other things. So I really appreciate that we, we wondered. And I just want to know your fi everyone's final thoughts on, perhaps I can bring it back to the title of, what's a Colombo identity for you, Bradman? And for you, Harlik, and for you, Asher. We start with Bradman, and then we close. Well, I think I expressed it even briefly that I would like Colombo, while it changes, not to change too fast, not to change too dramatically. Let Colombo retain that beautiful sense of history, the sense that it came together with a lot of different people coming here. I think the Muslims were the first here. The Muslims were here even before the Portuguese. So let's remember the Muslims, let's remember the Catholics, Let's remember the Christians, let's remember the Buddhists, let's remember all of those in, a, in the way we yet have churches, covils, all still there. I mean, we have a lovely collection of, of monuments, really, of the past. And they represent the essential unity of Sri Lanka, which is diversity. Let's have a diverse country. What's wrong with diversity? Let's celebrate diversity. That's what we have. We have that. And we're trying to lose that. We're trying to get into individuality, specifics. But let's celebrate that we share everybody. I mean, finally, it can only be by a great amount of intermarriage, but even that's stopping now. Even that's getting less and less. Yeah. Uh, sorry, the question was uh, exactly what? What is your Colombo identity? Oh, um, I think what I really find fascinating about uh, Colombo is I can't pin down what its identity is, right? So that is where I'd like to leave it in the sense that it's still an open-ended question for me, you know, and, and this is like a journey that I'm taking through the work that I'm doing and, uh, you know, just like city walking, for example, is discovering that. And uh, so you mentioned uh, like monuments that sim symbolize uh, harmony and I discovered this when I went to Mutwal and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but you were talking about capitals and how areas of prosperity changed. I think in the 60s and 70s, Mutwal was a very prosperous neighborhood. If you go there, go there now, it almost feels like 
back where I'm from, I'm from Navalapitiya, it feels like Navalapitiya, like a very quiet old railway town, you know, I mean, streets are empty. It's possibly because I went on a Sunday or a poor, but that's the general vibe you get there. And you have Kovils and mosques and churches and temples, a hodgepodge of people living in such close proximity, it's, it's almost mind-blowing when you go there, you know, in that sense. So, I mean, my advice, I mean, I would like everyone to just go to these places and have so much you can just learn by just randomly passing through even in that sense, and that really informs the way you start seeing things. So personally, for me, it's a very open-ended thing and something that I like, I'd, I'd like to keep in that way because I don't think there's anything there that I can actually ever pin down like specifically, but something that I can keep discovering in that sense. Uh, I would say quite simply that Colombo does not have an identity. It is, as I said earlier, it is one of the most layered and complex societies in the world. And there is no reason for us all to have one identity. What we do need to have is tolerance of the hundred other identities that we see around us. Thank you very much, everybody. And thank you for, to the audience as well. Thank you.